Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening Dhamma. Thank you all for coming out. It's always great to see such a turnout locally. Everyone has come out of their rooms after a hard day's work, struggling with their own minds, all of you in Second Life and on YouTube who come out to listen. We have, I think, a full house here in Second Life on YouTube. My channel has surpassed 50,000 subscribers, apparently. I appreciate the, the effort that people are taking to practice the Buddhist teaching. It's not easy. It's not easy. Sometimes it seems like Buddhism is all about suffering, no? Hey, wait, didn't the Buddha talk about suffering? Wasn't that something he'd like to talk about? It's not very... That's not very encouraging, or... I think a lot of people, of course, look at Buddhism and are... Mm, not satisfied with it. On the surface, talking a lot about suffering. And then when they begin to practice meditation. Mm. <laughs> A lot of suffering. What the heck, right? This isn't what we want. What do we want? What, do we, what does everyone want? We want this happiness. Everyone wants happiness. No one wants suffering. And so to spend all our time talking about, thinking about suffering, it sounds rather unpleasant. It's kind of a recipe for unhappiness, one would think. question might come up, why didn't the Buddha talk more about happiness if he was so enlightened and so happy? Was the Buddha happy? If so, why, why didn't he talk about it more? It's a suspicion that perhaps the Buddha wasn't happy. And perhaps he was just denying the denying the, the existence or the potential for happiness. Why did he phrase it in a negative? It's a good question and um, it's led Buddhist teachers to try and reframe the Four Noble Truths as happiness. Happiness, the cause of happiness, the cessation of happiness and the path which leads to the cessation of happiness and so to, to explain it in, in exactly the opposite way. Which is fine. But the question remains, why didn't the Buddha do that? Why didn't the Buddha talk like that? And it comes down, I think, the, a, a big problem is the question, of course, what is happiness? What do we mean when we say happiness? We certainly don't mean the physical pleasure, no? Is that what we mean by happiness? I think most of us have gotten beyond that. As children, we, we seek out the pleasure of ice cream, the pleasure of bright colors, shiny objects, toys, games, tickling, snuggling, hugging, kissing. Well, adults actually fall into that as well, but sensual happiness. And I think for the most part, adults come to see beyond that. Because as you grow up, you realize it's actually really just a recipe for disappointment through addiction, right? 
when children become addicted to pleasure, they're ultimately, they're ultimately disappointed. When they can't get what they want, they throw a tantrum and they suffer a lot. And they start to see the, maybe not consciously, but certainly through practice and through experience, they see the nature of sensuality as being um, a mix, an inevitable mix of pleasure and pain. You can't, have, you can't really have one without the other. Because being partial to something is, is having expectations about it. May it stay. And of course, nothing lasts forever. And when things eventually change, there's disappointment, there's pain, there's stress, there's suffering. So beyond that, I think generally people will look at more refined forms of happiness. And even though it's very hard to give up the addiction to sensual pleasure, we tend to see that, well, it's, it might be fun, but it can't be considered true happiness. And so we look beyond that to things like bhava, bhava sukha or we bhava sukha. So kama sukha, it's not the way, but what about bhava sukha and we bhava sukha? Meaning, what about states of being? Look at us sitting in this room, how happy we are, how wonderful is this. We have a roof over our heads, good company, good food. I don't know how good the food is, but we have frozen food. Uh, warmth, you know, our ability to sit here together in peace, not have to fight. These are bhava sukha, we bhava sukha, we have states of being. When you get a new job, for example, it's funny because why would you celebrate that? It means you have to go work, but the idea of having a new job, the concept of it is a great thing. Everyone's congratulatory, which you know, has nothing to do with sensuality because essentially speaking, it's a lot. you're just suffering because you have to go to work. But conceptually, it's a great thing because it ultimately allows you more sensual pleasure potentially, or it allows you freedom from pain. So, the concept of getting a job is a great happiness. Having a family. Someone sent me a. I don't want to. I don't really want to tease this person too much, but they sent me a an email at. Uh, because they wanted to let me know of the wonderful the wonderful occasion of having a child, and the way they the way they expressed it was um, they wanted to share the great great moment with me, and I, I thought to myself, well, from a Buddhist perspective, it's not really something we congratulate people. <laughs> you know, when the Buddha left home, he found out he was a father. And he said, Rahulang Jatang, a fetter has been born. And the king heard this, and the king said, well then let that be his name. Kind of out of spite, it seems, but that's what he called, that's what his son ended up being called, Rahula, which means a bond or a bind. Because before he left the Bodhisattva, he said, Rahulang Jatang. But, you know, this is it. We, when things happen, they please us. We think, this is what life is all about. The joie de vivre, for example, this kind of thing. Taking a walk in the forest. It's not really the sensuality per se, it's the peace. You might even say the vibhava tanha, the vibhava sukha. The not having to deal with all the stress of life. You go to work, you go to school. You, deal with your family and it's all stress and suffering and so you leave and just the freedom from all of that stress that's happiness I think. I think there are other ways of looking at happiness I know some people are optimistic and they think optimism positivity is happiness 
So as long as you see the good in everything, it's an example. I think uh, Pollyanna is a bit of an example of that. But uh, when I was, there was um, this movie, Life is Wonderful, I think, when I was in university a long time ago, about the Holocaust and this Jewish man and his son and, and he, he looked at everything positively and, and as a result good things happened to him but eventually he was killed in a concentration camp but up to the end he he uh, had a positive attitude so we look at this kind of thing and we say well that's it and this is I think how neuroscientists tend to talk about happiness um, that some people are more capable of being happy because of their positive outlook and so there was this one um, one researcher who, who was talking about how through meditation you can become more positive and you can you can retrain your mind your brain and your mind to be more happy you know, as a result of being more positive and, and rebounding from negative experiences quicker and so on I think that gets closer to Buddhist concept, but of course positivity has its problems as well. It's less likely to lead to disappointment, but it's it's still likely to lead one to complacency in the sense that one suffers, but one doesn't take it seriously and one refuses to, or one... Um, and doesn't engage in in dwelling on it. At the same time, doesn't engage in fixing it. Right? Doesn't free oneself from it. So it keeps coming. The suffering does come back. It's just it doesn't last long. So it's arguably superior to um, to, to the other sorts of of happiness. And, and moving on in 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 Buddhism, the other type of happiness that's sort of in a category of its own is the happiness of meditation. It could be together with this idea of positivity, but it's not exactly. It's a change in mind state, to be sure. But it's a change in mind state to the extent that one, one experience constant and prolonged states that are, are pleasurable, are happy. So like the first jhana, the first trance of tranquility meditation is, is accompanied with happiness. It's a kind of happiness that's removed from addiction. You can't actually be addicted to the happiness because the mind isn't cultivating addiction. At that. There's, there's no, it's so focused or there's no room for uh, clinging to it. It's so powerful that the mind doesn't develop the addiction. It's freeing, it's liberating in that sense. And so often people who practice this will, will, will describe it as being a liberation or being um, liberating. It is possible to become attached to the idea of the jhanas and when you leave them behind, want them again. And so ultimately the Buddha um, noted about this type of happiness. He said, well, that's the pinnacle, really, of, of any kind of feeling, but it's still impermanent. When you leave it, you can still be left wanting more. You think about that, and you compare it to what you have when you're out of the jhana, and you want the jhana back, but they're not permanent. And ultimately, this is re the real problem with, with any of the types of happiness, anything that we could call happiness. For beyond you know, the, the, the ultimate happiness, which of course I'm going to get to. Um, is that it doesn't last. You can say, I've got the best life, you know, this is working for me. People who have good jobs, good cars, even, well, you start at the bottom, people who have sensual, the, the, Height, the pinnacle of sensual pleasure, angels, for example, human beings who are rich, powerful. 
the drug addicts even will think for for a time that they are in heaven, but it doesn't last. When you have a good job, a good status, security, you feel secure. Yeah, it doesn't last. People who have positive, even if you have positive thoughts, if your mind, if your brain is wired such that you uh, are able to be positive about everything, to be happy, even in the face of great suffering, even that doesn't last. There's no, there's no reason to think that that state is going to be permanent. That positivity leads, you know, that, that, it's, that it's stable. In fact, what we find through wisdom, meaning as we truly understand the nature of all of this, reality, happiness and suffering, is that freedom from suffering is far preferable to any of these states. And so we have, we have to talk about, technically, and happiness as being a negative thing. The negative in the sense of being free from something as opposed to gaining something but it's it's not being free from any one experience it's not like we bhava sukha where when something goes away you feel happy oh good it's gone what a relief and that's a key point because that people misunderstand that freedom from suffering the happiness is because oh good I'm not suffering anymore but it's not really. it's not a relief it's not a feeling of relief. Because the things that caused you happiness and caused you suffering before are still there. The change is that you're no longer seeking them. You're no longer uh, disturbed by them. You're no longer subject to their control. So there's the happiness of freedom. the happiness of being in a state or of gaining the knowledge, the understanding that nothing is worth clinging to. Basically that there is nothing that can make you happy. It's a kind of happiness that goes beyond any type of happiness. And it's not dependent on anything. It's not subject to change. It's not vulnerable. It's invincible. And beyond that, it it is experienced as far preferable, far superior. Anyone who has attained a state of freedom no longer holds any delusion about sensuality or becoming or even non-becoming. Even the jhanas. The idea that they might be somehow ultimate or true happiness and so this is the, the Buddha actually said quite clearly he said nati santi parang sukham which isn't a quote that we often it's not something we often bring up because it sounds kind of well it's contentious because it's hard to understand this with all of our ideas of what is happiness nati santi parang sukham means there's no happiness outside of peace Peace is the only sort of happiness. Which is, is I mean, it, it's sensible, it's reasonable. But it's hard to understand because it's a negative. You know, happiness, peace is, 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 peace is a sublime state. It's not really familiar to most people, and it's not really even all that desirable for a lot of people, except in maybe a, an abstract sense, oh, I wish I had some peace of mind, for example. But peace is something quite sublime. It was once asked of of Sariputta, one of the monks, Yamaka, I think was his name. He asks Sariputta, if there's no Vedana, if there's no Vedana Nibbana, 
how can you say it's happiness? How can you say Nibbana is happiness when there's no Vedana? Vedana means feeling, so happiness is a type of feeling, right? That's the idea. You have happy feelings. Pleasant feelings, unpleasant feelings, neutral feelings. If there's no feelings in Nibbana, if freedom has no feelings, how can you say it's happiness? Right? This is, I think, a sticking point for a lot of people. If there's a fear of the idea of Nibbana. I have to give up the world. But there's so much in the world that I want. Actually, Nibbana isn't about giving up the world. It's about leaving it behind, and it's something that can be experienced for a short time. It's not something that... It's not an all-or-nothing thing. It's not like, whoops, wait, let me back. I want to go back. Let me off, let me off. No. Something you experience and you're able to see. Is it worth it? Is it not worth it? Sariputta's reply was, it's precisely because there is no Vedana that Nibbana is happiness. Sublime. Very difficult to understand unless you practice meditation. Of course, as you practice, you start to shed more and more of your attachments, more and more of your desires. As you see, the things that you thought were happiness are not really happiness. Until finally you truly let go an epiphany and the mind says oh yes nothing's worth clinging to and then poof a cessation then you can then you can answer this question whether Nibbana is happiness or not when you experience it for yourself so there you go there's the Dhamma for this evening I hope the audio didn't cut out thank you all here locally for sitting patiently, coming out to listen, and uh, to everyone at home, wish you all good practice, and thank you for tuning in.